In India, they developed an aesthetic theory that explained why it is that you can see people suffering on stage and still get some enjoyment from it. It's not the idea that you're being sadistic or enjoy their suffering. You sympathize with their suffering, but you enjoy the sympathy. And the theory comes down to the idea that on stage emotions are being portrayed, and the audience tastes the emotion. They don't feel the emotion directly. And different emotions, when they're portrayed, provoke different tastes in the audience. And when grief is being portrayed, the taste is compassion. You feel sorry for the person who's suffering. And there's an enjoyment in that feeling of compassion. But this connection carries over beyond plays into real life. When you've lost a member of the family and you feel grief, the best reaction is compassion. Compassion for yourself and then from there spreading out to others. It recognizes the pain, doesn't deny it, but at the same time it develops some distance from it. You feel sorry for yourself, you feel sorry for the person that's gone, then you start realizing that everybody goes through all this. You know the story about the woman who had lost her baby. Who denied that it was dead. This is a story in the commentary. She goes to the Buddha, and the Buddha says, well, you can make medicine for the baby, but it has to be made from a mustard seed, which in India is very easy to find. But it has to come from a mustard seed in a family where nobody's ever died. So the woman goes from house to house asking for mustard seed, and people are glad to give her the mustard seed. But then when she asks, oh, by the way, has anyone in this family died? Oh, of course. Mothers died, fathers died, sister, brother, son, daughter, grandfather, grandmother, grandchild. And by the end of the day, she's finally ready to admit that yes, her son, her baby is dead. It's one of the reasons why, when King Vasanity lost his favorite queen, the Buddha had him think about all the people in the world who lost, who have lost people. And you might think that the thought of so many people and so many deaths would be depressing, but no, it's, it gives rise to a sense of compassion. And compassion is the emotion that feels right at that time. It's the taste that is appropriate for grief, but at the same time helps pull you out. This is one of the reasons why when people pass away, we think of making merit and dedicating it to them. And the Buddha says those who passed away may be in a state where they can receive it and may be in a state where they can't. But you want to do it anyhow, just in case. Whether in a state where they can receive it, it's when they have a way of knowing. Hungry ghosts. Beings are seeking birth, as I say. These categories, they can know of merit that's being dedicated to them. And if they appreciate it, then that becomes their merit. And John Fung had a student who started seeing visions of hungry ghosts, and they're all over the place. And she didn't like it. So she went to him and asked, Can I? turn off this channel. He said, no, there's something to be learned. You can dedicate merit, but at the same time you want to ask them what they did to become hungry ghosts. And she found all kinds of people suffering from the unskillful things they'd done. Then she dedicate the merit of her meditation, and in some cases they'd receive it and they'd go beyond the state of being hungry ghosts, and others just couldn't, for whatever the karma was. So then that, that got the woman upset. What do you do in cases like that? And then John Fu said that your duty is to do your best. And if, if they can't keep up their end of the bargain, well, maybe somebody else can help them. 
But the lesson she learned from all this was there's so many people out there suffering. And the only appropriate response is compassion. This helps with the maturation of the heart when you start being sensitive to all that suffering, but at the same time not so sensitive that it gets you down. But it does make you treat people more kindly. You realize that we don't have that much time together. So if there's anything good you want to say to somebody else, say it. Any appreciation for their goodness? Show your appreciation. Because everybody in the world is suffering so much. What good we can do for one another helps to lessen that burden. And it lifts our hearts as well. That we're not so wound up in our own problems that we can't think about others. This larger perspective is always important, because when you take the larger perspective, then you can look back at your own life and see it from a different angle, in a way where the narratives don't eat away at the heart so much. The Buddha, in the first watch of the night of his awakening, saw all his many rebirths. But in the second watch, he pulled himself out of that story just about himself and became the story of the cosmos. And he saw how much suffering was still going on. On the one hand, the proper response is compassion, on the other is the desire for release. That's what led to his third knowledge and then to his awakening. You got the same dynamic in the sutta and the five reflections that we often do. First, the Buddha has you reflect on the fact that you're not beyond aging, illness, and death, or as in the Thai translation, that aging, illness, and death are normal for you. There's going to be separation. That's also normal. And what you have to depend on, though, is your actions. Reflecting on that much gives rise to a sense of heedfulness. But then you go further, which we don't have in our evening chant, which is you reflect on the fact that all beings everywhere are subject to aging, illness, and death, subject to separation. And the proper response there is, one, sangwega, and then two, a desire for release. Because no matter where you go in this universe, you're going to find people you love, and then you're going to be separated from them, and then you're going to meet them again. And it goes back and forth like that. And sometimes as you move from one configuration to another, it's like shuffling cards. Sometimes the love grows stronger, sometimes something happens and it turns into something else. And this has gone on and on and on for who knows how long. Thinking about that can, can be oppressive, but the Buddha doesn't leave you there with that feeling of oppression. He, said, he says there is a way out, and it's available for everybody. Sometimes it sounds selfish when you want to get out of samsara and leave everybody behind, but samsara is not a place, it's an activity. samsara ing is what we do. And in the course of doing it, we create a lot of suffering for ourselves, and we create suffering for others. Even when we're good with them, we can be with them only for so long. Then there's a pain of separation. So love and pain have to go together. But there is a way out. 
That's the path we're following right now. As we learn how to stop samsaring, we stop creating suffering for ourselves, and we stop creating suffering for others. The idea that samsara and nirvana are the same thing is totally ridiculous. Samsara is the process by which pain is created. Nirvana is the end of the process. And by taking the path there, you're showing other people that, yes, they can take the path too. If they ever get around to realizing that the cause of the problem lies inside, as the Buddha said, there's an arrow in your heart. And what we're trying to do here is develop the skill so that each of us can remove that arrow. And as long as we're in the world, we don't have to suffer. When we leave the world, there's no suffering then either. And this is how we show true compassion for ourselves and for the people around us.